William, for starting this off. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to this fifth panel in our 20th anniversary series, looking at the future of federalism. As some of you who followed the forum know, the forum was founded in the year 2000, following a major international conference in Mont-Tremblant, uh, which was organized by Canada's then Prime Minister, Prime Minister Chrétien, and attended by President Bill Clinton and President Ernesto Zaido from Mexico. Uh, we had hoped uh, in October 2020 to celebrate 20 years of the forum with a major international conference. Unfortunately, our plans, as everybody else's plans, were upended by the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's very much in that context that we are convening this panel. Uh, we have a number of panelists representing uh, our, our member countries, Canada, uh, India, Ethiopia, and Germany. And we have, a, a, we have today uh, people who are practitioners in their own right, who we hope will be able to share some of their perspectives on how the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has transformed the nature of federal relations, or indeed, if it has. Uh, let me be brief here and introduce Sabine Krop, who will be our moderator for today. Uh, Sabine is professor at the Free University of Berlin and somebody who is a very, very close collaborator of the forum. I also want to take this opportunity to welcome uh, Ms. Louise Baer, uh, Otto Degefe Tolosa, uh, Dr. Hans Hoffman, and Professor Pinaki Chakravarti for taking time out of the schedule to join us this morning for what I hope will be a very engaging discussion. And, and I, I invite the audience uh, to follow closely and to put any questions that you have in the chat box so as uh, at the end of the panel, our panelists uh, might be able to address these. So over to you, Sabine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosak, for the nice introduction. So I also welcome you to this webinar with a dedicated um, one question which is being disputed is whether federalism as a principle of state organization has really played a decisive role in combating the pandemic. But the pandemic has an impact on how federalism is perceived and how it will work in the future. So principally, federal countries are able to give a holistic response while they provide tailor-made regional and local measures. Also, Federalism has often been praised as a political um, structure allowing for learning and experimentation. These attributes seem to provide invaluable assets for coping with large-scale problems. Looking into the future, however, I think it's not an overstatement to say that the acid test for federal states is still to be passed. This is when governments must cope with the social, fiscal, and economic consequences and budgetary constraints. So the overarching question we will discuss today is, what are the lessons learned and how can federal countries be made more resilient, robust, and flexible in the future? Before introducing the panelists, let me briefly explain the discussion rules for today. So in the first part of our event, we will have two rounds of discussion with the panelists. Each presenter will have about five minutes to give an input to the questions. This first part, including the two rounds of questions, will last about 20, uh, 40 to 45 minutes. Afterwards, I will open the floor to the audience for another 45 minutes. Please use the YouTube chat box and the Facebook comment section to address your questions. You can also send us questions already during the debate. The forum um, looks forward to taking up your comments. Now, I'm very glad to introduce our panelists who are in fact predestined to discuss the prospects of federalism. They come from countries that represent very diverse federal models. And I think this allows us to take both a holistic and differentiated view on the upcoming challenge. 
I warmly welcome Louise Baird. She's um, the Assistant Deputy Minister, Intergovernmental Affairs at the Privy Council Office in the Government of Canada. Prior to joining the government, she worked at the Treasury Board Secretariat, which is another Government of Canada central agency. She also spent several years in a variety of senior leadership roles in Canada's Federal Industry Department. The second speaker is Degefa Tolosa Digaga, Professor of Geography and Development at the College of Development Studies in Addis Abeba. He authored numerous books and uh, a lot of articles in local and international journals and received a number of awards, grants and fellowships. The third speaker is Hans Hoffmann. He is Director General in the Federal Ministry of the Interior, Building and Community in the Federal Government of Germany. He is also a part-time lecturer and professor at the Law Faculty of the Humboldt University here in Berlin. Among the various positions he has occupied in public service, he served as Deputy Director General at the Federal Chancellery. And finally, I'm very glad to welcome Pinaki Chakraborty, Director of National Institute and Public Finance and Policy in New Delhi. Prior to this function, he was the Chief Social Policy and the Chief of Field Office UNICEF Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Chakraborty has critical domain knowledge of the public finances of the national and the state governments, and has, has served on the advisory committees of various research institutions in India. So welcome um, to this panel. And um, I would like to start with a more general question, which goes to all of the panelists. Um, in the context of your country, how is the COVID crisis likely to impact the practice of federalism and more specifically, has it already changed the way in which the Federation functions? And looking forward, um, what should we expect to see once the crisis is passed? So Mrs. Baird, how would you summarize the Canadian experience in this respect? So thank you very much and good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, so in the Canadian context, um, I'd say the pandemic amplified the role and the significance of intergovernmental relations in the Canadian federalism. Before COVID, um, first minister's meetings, and these are meetings between the prime minister and the premiers of the uh, provinces and the territories, those meetings um, would typically occur about once a year. Since March 2020, when the, uh, the global pandemic was announced, there have been 31 meetings of first ministers. So right there, that is a pretty strong indication, I think, of uh, the level of collaboration that's happened throughout the pandemic. Um, the, prime, the prime minister and the premiers themselves have called it unprecedented collaboration. And this FPT engagement has been happening at multiple levels. Uh, in addition to the first ministers, um, ministers um, and deputy ministers from many departments, including health and public safety. They've met very, very frequently throughout the pandemic. And while there's been an adaptation and a, I say a stronger role in some areas for the federal government, generally the response to COVID has been done in accordance with the constitutional division of responsibilities. We can look at the, um, the vaccine rollout as an example in Canada. Given the global demand and the need to procure from international suppliers, the contract negotiations and coordination of, of shipping into the country was centralized in the federal government, which is not its typical role. The federal government used its purchasing power to buy for the entire country and asked the Canadian Armed Forces to lead on the complex logistics to get the vaccines out to the provinces and territories. The provinces who have primary jurisdiction over healthcare manage their allocations and distribution with their own, within their own jurisdictions. And then right down at the local level, municipalities ran the vaccine clinics and drove public, public awareness to get people into the clinics and to get their vaccines. 
Um, the division of responsibilities and, and the effective coordination is helping to ensure a successful vaccine rollout. Canada has one of the highest rates of vaccination among G20 uh, countries. Similar to vaccines, the federal government also managed the purchase and distribution of personal protective equipment and testing supplies. Um, but typically the Canadian Federation is, is highly decentralized. Last spring when provinces began exercising their powers under their respective emergency or health legislations, they were able to put in place things like travel restrictions, isolation requirements, and enforcement measures to mitigate the pandemic. At this time, there was some public and media pressure directed at the federal government to invoke the National Emergencies Act. However, the, the Emergencies Act is a measure of last resort in Canada, and before declaring a public welfare emergency under the Act, it must be determined that certain conditions are met, including that the situation exceeds the capacity of a province or territory to deal with it, and that it can't be addressed adequately under any other law of Canada, including those of the provinces and territories. The act requires that the federal government consult provinces and territories before declaring an, an emergency. Um, and when the, this was done, this consultation was done and, and the premiers of all the provinces and territories were unanimous that it was not necessary or advisable to invoke the act at the national level. The provinces and, and territories used the many levers that they had and the federal government relied on existing laws such as the quarantine act to respond to COVID-19. The federal government used the approach of cooperative federalism in supporting provinces in their management of the pandemic. And we also saw this in things like the federal government offering what we call surge support in areas like contact tracing, lab capacity testing, and medical personnel to support the provinces and territories in, hand, in managing and carrying out their responsibilities in sort of the health space or the health jurisdiction. We also saw a lot of regional responses to COVID. Um, you know, Canada is a very big country geographically and, and in part because the disease affected different parts of the country differently. We saw some regional approaches um, take place. Um, for example, in Eastern Canada and the Atlantic provinces, they sort of banded together and created a bit of a bubble around a collection of several provinces to sort of restrict people coming into those areas, but also sort of managing things and some of their restrictions as a collective, um, as part of that specific region. The provinces and territories also showed solidarity. They, there's an official group called the, the Council of the Federation, which is made up of the 13 premiers. And like the first ministers, they met much more frequently during the last 15 months. And through other specific actions, um, you know, they shared uh, personal protective equipment when one province was, was more in need and another one had surplus, or they sent uh, medical staff, for example, from one jurisdiction to another when there was a particular hotspot. Um, Canadians expected this le level of cooperation from their governments in the face of a public health crisis. Um, COVID-19 has required a lot of adaptation, but I would say without fundamentally altering the Federation. So on the question about whether it will continue or how things might change, I expect that a higher level of cooperation will remain at least in the near term because of the benefits that is, it has provided over the last many months. But I think we're also conscious of the fact that you know, some political tensions may reemerge when governments are no longer sort of united uh, together against this, this common en enemy of the, of the public health crisis. Um, so we expect that some provinces may see less advantage in working as closely with the federal government as they have done over the last 15 months. I think that there are some of the, the meetings and the intergovernmental mechanisms that have met more frequently may continue, um, and we'll certainly need to look to maintain some of the strong federal, provincial, and territorial engagement uh, that's happened over some of the shared priorities, and especially in some of the social policy areas that we think will, will need some attention going forward uh, that came to light with the pandemic. Hey, thank you. Um, so, Professor De Gagaf, Ethiopian federalism must cope with multiple challenges at the time. So can you briefly explain how COVID has changed the federal system? And if so, which changes do you expect to see in the future? Thank you, Chair. Uh, good day, everyone. And uh, I extend my thanks for, for giving me the opportunity. Um, 
taking part in today's uh, dialogue series uh, on behalf of His Excellency Adam Farah, Speaker, House of the Federation, Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, who couldn't make uh, because of uh, other commitment, and he sincerely asked for uh, apologies to the organizers. However, I would like to underline the views and opinions I'm attempting to advance are my own. As you all know, uh, the Ethiopian government has two uh, levels of government, the federal and the uh, regional states, uh, the 10 regional uh, states that uh, comprise uh, the, the federation. Uh, and it is also important to mention that uh, the member states of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia shall have uh, equal status, uh, powers, and functions uh, for both levels of the government have been uh, given. Upon identifying uh, the first uh, COVID-19 case on March 13, 2020, the Ethiopian government has responded to the pandemic uh, in a quite organized manner by setting and putting in place workable preventive and curative strategies. The governments at different levels took a number of precautionary measures to manage the spread of the virus and attempted to set strategies in case the disease wide spreads. At the federal level, uh, ministerial task force headed by uh, the deputy prime minister was formed. Aggressive resource mobilization efforts were also exerted in case the pandemic put a disastrous effect at macro and micro levels. Likewise, the regional states have created a task force in charge of controlling COVID-19 and its impact. The Federal Ministry of Health of, and the Ethiopian Institute of Public Health were given the responsibilities of awareness creation in the arena of prevention and managing the curative measures against the outbreak of COVID-19. Likewise, every regional state has formed its task force committee that issued directives on preventive measures and curative actions, as well as setting up task forces at different levels down to the communities. Like in the other parts of the world, COVID-19 has got a lot of health, economic, social, political impact that were clearly manifested in the way the federal government and the regional states responded to the crisis. The society has also developed a multiple of coping and adapting strategies against COVID-19. Modifications were made to the lifestyles of sizable proportion of population, both in urban and rural setting. If you just to look at some of some of the facts related to the health impact, uh, about 271 uh, patient cases uh, were uh, reported, uh, of which more than 4,000 people have lost their lives. The total recovered cases were about 236,000, and more than 30,000 people are still uh, in corona uh, virus active cases, uh, which, which is according to the update by the Ministry of Health of Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. The economic impact at the macro and household level have been so immense. Ethiopian airlines have partially stopped its operations during the early months. The tourist flows toward Ethiopia was almost nil, as a result of which some hotels and other service delivery institutions were collapsing. Some manufacturing industries have either shut down or compelled to make shifts in commodities being made. So the government didn't implement the total lockdown. Schools and the universities were closed over months. The majority of civil servants stayed at home 
and many informal petty traders and those who work in uh, uh, different uh, artisan work were terribly hit by the COVID-19 crisis. Some studies have revealed that the period of COVID-19 is a time of the lowest savings at household and at individual level across the country. Furthermore, COVID-19 has adversely affected the revenue generating capacity of uh, the federal government as well as the regional states. In terms of social relations impact, a lot of formal and informal social relations were halted because of the pandemic. Public rituals related to marriage, days, festivals, and the religious ceremonies were considerably restricted. And Ethiopia was compelled to postpone the general election by more than one year, which has been one of the points of contest between the government and the various political parties. Likewise, a number of activities related to consolidating intergovernmental relations were postponed to the other times or had to slow down as well, which directly or indirectly affected the federal system. Therefore, COVID-19 has affected the way the federal government and the regional states function. Plans by public institutions and individuals have been considering two scenarios with COVID-19 and without COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, uh, it is possible to, to say that a lot of changes are expected to happen if the crisis of COVID-19 will over in good time. And over to you, thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, contribution. So German federalism was often criticized for producing a patchwork of measures. So Mr. Hoffmann, could you possibly um, um, evaluate the situation in Germany and also give us an idea of how it will develop in the future? You must switch on your micro. Now it's better. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. I will already switch to my German language. Uh, this the, the pandemic was a huge problem in the whole world. Pandemic was a huge problem all over the world and Germany too, of course, and also for German federalism. In Germany, our system is such that, especially when it comes to protecting against threats, the lender, the German states have constitutional authority to do that. That means that since March 2020, the lender were operationally responsible for the measures that needed to be taken locally and for the implementation of these measures. The federal government, however, intervened early to address the relevant law, the Infection Protection Act. It changed it and it gave the federal government some authorities that the epidemiological situation had to be specified by the federal level, creating a basis for measures to be taken at the level of the German states, the lender. These measures stipulated a broad curtailing of freedoms in Germany. I'd be happy to tell you that in Germany, of course, rail traffic and flight traffic was sharply curtailed and sometimes even totally shut down. Schools and universities also worked remotely, if at all. In some cases, they were shut down completely. That was a large deficit for educational institutions and for students and pupils in Germany. It goes without saying that there were universities that continued to operate. Although fundamentally speaking, a lot of students and a lot of pupils had to deal with sharp restrictions. And this also affected the German economy, which came into a deficit situation, which suffered a recession. Regulations came to the point that 30% of employees in German companies 
were working in a remote system, working in their home offices, and continue to do so. But many trading companies were also closed. In the meantime, some of them have been partially opened, but only with compliance with stringent hygienic measures. On the whole, you could say that the German federalism system, that it has gone through quite a test. The conclusion is that we have overcome this test, that is, we passed it. But there are some aspects that are urgent, that are definitely lessons learned that need to be filtered out of this process. So I'd be very grateful for, I'm very grateful for this event, affording us the opportunity to compare our system with other federal systems. The German legal system is a little bit complicated. The federal government uh, stipulates regulations, but they have to be implemented by the German states. The implementation throughout the 14 or 15 months of the pandemic of Germany was not always uniform. Uh, patchwork was the key word that you mentioned yourself. But this word is a little bit uh, ambiguous in meaning because patchwork, what does that mean? That means there's some places with a high incidence of infection. And that means there's a different legal situation there than there is in an area with low incidence. Those are differences. They are patches. They exist side by side, but these patches are quite justified because there's some areas with high incidence, and there you need more stringent rules than in other areas where there is not such a high incidence. So that means this term, patchwork, is actually a positive expression. This year, in the spring, we had a process of coordination with the lender, and that brought some bigger problems. We therefore created a system. It was a federal system. There, there would be a particular incidence, namely 100, and that would be considered to be the threshold. And anywhere where this threshold was reached, then automatically certain legal consequences would be triggered. So above this threshold, the regulations would enter into force. If you were underneath this margin or this threshold, then, then this state of affairs would be deactivated. And the second aspect of the system meant that there would be a self-executing norm that was put in place. These measures would be implemented by virtue of law that led to a distinction. Sometimes this distinction was late at the level of the states. And we enshrined this distinction that led to a decrease in incidents in Germany. We've had this regulation in place since about uh, for, for about five weeks. And since then, the incidence has dropped by more than 50%. And we have high hopes that we will be able to grapple successfully with the third uh, wave and that we won't see another third wave. Some people have already said that special processes special committee situations uh, could be put in place. That's the, that's the case in Germany too. We have what's known as a COVID cabinet. It's a special committee. We call it the Corona cabinet in Germany. And this is a special body of the federal government. And it, it meets with all of the ministers that are competent in this area. And uh, it met and made decisions the German Bundestag then uh, made regulations that were then enact, uh, implemented by the state governments. Also, there was what's known as the Minister-President Conference. That is a coordination organization for all of the 16 heads of state, uh, of the states, the federal chancellor and the 16 minister-presidents. They, they meet anyway at this conference. This conference meets several times a year, but typically only twice a year. But during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, there were uh, around 28 such meetings in the 14 months. They discussed the situation in each German state, in each region. 
discuss the role of the federal government and the measures that needed to be taken, conclusions that needed to be drawn from the situation. This system, this committee, is actually not at all stipulated by German law. It's an informal coordinating body. So it's quite interesting for science uh, because this pure coordinating function began to uh, lead to decisions. There were decisions that were made by consensus among the 17, 16 states on the implementation of federal measures. And there are some possibilities for improvement that you can really clearly see. Finally, I'd like to talk about another committee, namely the Conference of Health Ministers. That is the mirror image of this Conference of Heads of State. However, it is responsible for health. The 17 ministers of health of the states and the federal minister of health have also met very frequently. Uh, they made an attempt to, to coordinate analyses and to, to make orders as well. So in conclusion, my, con my conclusion would be yes, federalism is the best system for responding to various geographical situations in the COVID-19 pandemic to respond to those different situations. Federalism has the requisite flexibility. It has the ability to make tailored solutions and an ability to also apply the principle of proportionality. But when coordination doesn't work in optimal fashion, there is also a need for improvement. This is the task that we all have together and that we will uh, carry out uh, going forward. I turn the floor over. Thank you. Us the uh, coordination in German federalism. So some of you already mentioned that there was more coordination in the federal system, also in Canada, which is a highly decentralized federal state. So when looking into the Indian case, um, can we observe similar tendencies in Indian federalism, Mr. Chakraborty? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this discussion. Uh, thank you, Rupak. Thank you, Forum. Uh, I would make three very specific points to the question that you raised. I think the role of federalism with appropriate fiscal autonomy has emerged as one of the effective tools to fight the pandemic. And there is no doubt about it. This has happened in large established federation. This has also happened very effectively in emerging federal economies. Federal or no federal, I, this is not a wonder why it is happening. Federal or no federal, the point of delivery of public services is always at the decentralized level, even in many unitary system. COVID pandemic brought this issue to the forefront that with effective functional federal system, one can reach quickly to the person in need of assistance. We have seen that uh, in many contexts at the local level in India, both during the first wave as well as in the second wave. The role played by various subnational governments, local governments to deal with the pandemic, I think if we look at the best practices is exemplary. We never thought uh, in a normal situation that a local government or a subnational government with limited fiscal autonomy would be able to respond so quickly and so effectively in certain situations. In India, health is a state subject. Two thirds of the public health spending is at the state level. And if we look at total government spending, 58% of the combined government expenditure is at the state level. So we, though we have a state list, union list and concurrent list, I think the role that is played by the subnational government is very significant. And that role probably has gone up during the pandemic and is going to go up after the pandemic as well. So going forward, I strongly believe 
the federal system and institutions will have to play a larger role. And when I say larger role, it has three components. One is during the pandemic, de dealing with the pandemic, uh, uh, trying to stop the spread of virus. Second is providing livelihood support. So life versus livelihood issue becomes very important and providing livelihood support can best be done by the subnational government, even if the money comes from the local level. And we have seen that happening in many parts of the world. Strengthening health system at the subnational level will become a very important issue, even in case of health services provided by the local governments. I'm not talking about the state governments. State governments are a big entity in India spending 58% of the total, total government spending. But when we talk about local government, local governments that includes municipalities and rural local governments and their fiscal autonomy, if we look at their role in managing public finances, uh, public health system going forward will become, will become very, very important and critical. Uh, uh, and if we look at the Indian Finance Commission's latest report, which governs the center-state fiscal relation, it's a constitutional body, also emphasized the role of the state-local relations in improving health system at the local level. So going forward, I see a bigger role of subnational units below the state level. It's not only the states, below the state level. That means the third tier going to play a major role. Major role. And, and, and for that uh, reason, I think there is also a need for greater fiscal autonomy to the third tier globally. Last point that I wanted to talk about is the issues related to fiscal stimulus to deal with pandemic. And in India, uh, and also the experience of you know other countries when we look at the the, the fiscal stimulus though provided by the Mac, uh, by, by, by the by, by the by, by the uh, national governments I think the role played by local governments subnational governments in 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 delivering what is provided in the stimulus has not been well documented I think that role is very important to what role they have played is very important to understand secondly when the resources are declining because of the contraction in the economy uh, and local government with little uh, with, with, with limited fiscal autonomy would require larger sources of alternative resources and in that context I think borrowing is one source that has been that has been used very effectively to provide necessary fiscal space to the subnational governments in India to deal with the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the coordinating regional solution to sovereignty and the threats, which is more sensitive to federalism as a state, a principle of state organization. But when we look at the role that federal and national governments have played in backstopping subnational finances, does this lay the ground for greater centralization in the future? Um, or is this a solution which is um, not very, um, which should not be expected? And what does this mean for fiscal federalism in your country? Um, well, um, in the second round, we also have the same presenters. And I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Baer to explain from the view of a highly decentralized federation, what is your experience with centralizing trends during the pandemic and possibly in the future? Thank you for the question. Um, I, I think so far in the panel discussion, there's been quite a bit of, of talk about cooperation. So I think I'll continue that theme a little bit just now. And maybe you know make the distinction a little bit between cooperation and centralization. Um, the cooperative and, and temporary nature of the relief measures um, under these extraordinary circumstances, I don't think really represent centralization. Um, the federal financial assistance that was provided um, was done through consultations with the provinces and territories and with the municipalities and was time limited. So I think that's an important point as well. Um, the federal government's been a backstop to other orders of government by putting in place things like income supports and business programs, which are not normally part of the federal government's responsibilities. 
This has helped the, um, the provinces and territories make some of the difficult decisions that they had to make during the pandemic to shut down parts of their economies because the federal government was playing that backstop role. It also helped the municipalities sustain the public transit systems, which you know had very, very low ridership and, and low revenues, obviously. But you know, there were essential workers that still needed to use that public um, transit. And so um, the federal government provided support there so that, that that could be maintained. Probably one of the biggest or maybe best examples of that coordination um, was through a, a large agreement that was put in place last summer that was called the Safe Restart Agreement. Um, it was um, an agreement between the federal government and the provinces and the territories. Um, you know, the provinces, as is fairly standard opening position, would have preferred to see an unconditional transfer of funds, but the federal government wanted to provide support in some specific priority areas directly related to the pandemic. So this was negotiated and ultimately agreed to among Canada's first ministers, again, through these very regular first ministers meetings. It culminated in an over $19 billion um, federal investment, but again, for a time limited period. So it covered a six to eight month period. And this was to help um, provinces and territories safely re restart or, or plan for restarting their economies and also protect the health of Canadians. Um, although it was directed in these certain certain areas to do with um, obviously all pandemic related, there was flexibility built in so that the provinces and territories were able to use the funding in the way that was most appropriate for their specific jurisdiction. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there was the pandemic all obviously struck different parts of the country in different ways. And when you look at some of the rural and remote parts of the country versus some of the you know big urban centers, it needed to be dealt with a little bit differently. The federal government also provided um, some funding through what was called the Safe Return to Class Fund. And while education is provincial and territorial jurisdiction, you know, the federal government provided this money so that provinces could mitigate the risk of infection in schools for both students and teachers, and then be able to adapt the programming to sort of the reality of COVID with social distancing and smaller class sizes. Um, in, the, in the most recent federal budget uh, that was tabled in April, there was a commitment to continue to support uh, provinces and territories through the current third wave of the pa pandemic and then into the economic recovery. This included extensions of business programs and benefits for individuals and things like funding for training. Um, it also committed um, work, ongoing work with the provinces um, to improve access to virtual health care to long-term care, which sort of came out through the pandemic as, as some, there were some challenges that were identified, and also child care. Child care was the signature budget item um, and recognized the disproportionate impact that the pandemic had on women in the workforce. Um, the pandemic certainly did reveal important gaps in certain social policy areas, particularly in health care, child care, and elderly care. These are policy areas which fall primarily within provincial jurisdiction, but funding and commitments through the federal through the federal budget will help advance a lot of these files and these priorities. Um, and so this, this FPT, federal provincial territorial engagement and collaboration will need to continue in these areas of social policy, you know, sort of long after the pandemic. Um, before the pandemic, premiers had been raising concerns over the long-term sustainability of the healthcare system and some of the federal transfer payments. Um, the Council of the Federation, which is the group of the premiers, had requested a, a significant increase, a 35% increase to the Canada Health Transfer, which is a federal transfer, an unconditional transfer to provinces and territories. Um, you know, the, the Prime Minister has committed to having this discussion with Premiers, but only sort of after the immediate crisis is behind us. Um, on intergovernmental agreements on social policy, uh, provinces and territories are quite sensitive to the jurisdictional issues and sometimes reluctant on to have cost shared programs. But sort of this is an area I think we'll need to continue to work through given that um, some of these, these gaps or these issues, you know, came to light through the pandemic. Um, so dealing with those and at the same time respecting jurisdiction will be something that will continue in the coming months. In terms of uh, 
um, you know, the fiscal sort of division, the provinces and territories do have considerable fiscal autonomy. They generate about 80% of their revenues. Um, Canada is one of the most fiscally decentralized federations. Um, so we'll, you know, working through the negotiations over federal transfers and cost shared programs will will need kind of that ongoing um, engagement at the different orders of government. Um, our existing mechanisms of intergovernmental relations, though, do provide a framework for these discussions. We've seen that through the pandemic that we were able to mobilize and increase frequency of these intergovernmental forums. Um, so I think this, this cooperation, and again, I would sort of emphasize cooperation versus centralization will, will need to continue following the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Mrs. Baird. So from the Ethiopian uh, point of view, what role did centralizing trends and fiscal transfers play in order to cope with the consequences of the pandemic? Thank you, Professor uh, Sabine. Uh, well, uh, in the form of uh, a footnote uh, to my previous uh, reflection, I would like to underline that uh, COVID-19 has slowed down economic growth in the country and uh, exacerbated uh, poverty. Uh, against this uh, as a way of uh, protecting the vulnerable segment of the society, the government has uh, at the federal level and the regional level have put uh, the, the uh, safety net program uh, in place uh, and uh, our prime minister's uh, initiative by the title uh, Gabata Magarat, let us share our uh, uh, daily meal, uh, uh, which, which attracted the attention of a lot of people. Uh, coming back to uh, the second question, uh, basically, I don't believe that uh, COVID-19 pandemic has created uh, favorable condition for consolidating physical decentralization in Ethiopia. Uh, this is because uh, every uh, regional state uh, has developed strong institutional framework uh, in fight uh, against COVID-19 with regard to both uh, prevention and uh, curative efforts that largely relied on their own resources. Uh, this does not mean that uh, there was no cooperation uh, uh, resource transfer from the federal to, to the regional states. Uh, as for instance, uh, there were external financial resources uh, that were pledged to the Ethiopian government by uh, a number of uh, donors uh, like uh, COVID-19 testing uh, kits, package of uh, breathing devices, uh, face masks, uh, gloves, and, and, and the like that were uh, pledged by the name of the federal government. These uh, health facilities and uh, inputs uh, for establishment of uh, COVID-19 testing laboratories and putting in place special pandemic treatment centers uh, and associated tools were distributed to the regional states by the Federal Ministry of uh, Health. Uh, likewise, uh, recently, the distribution of a very uh, limited number of uh, uh, vaccine for COVID-19, uh, which is around 2.5 uh, million, uh, has followed uh, the, the same pattern in terms of uh, reaching out uh, the regional states. So uh, the physical federalism took uh, the context of COVID-19 uh, crisis in 2021, annual budget allocation. It has got its own uh, allocation criteria that take into account population size, uh, standing additional uh, funding requirements uh, for new infrastructure, and uh, to some extent, the potential capacity of the state to raise uh, a revenue. Uh, one can guess that the regional governments, uh, health bureaus have put extensive uh, health budget on COVID-19 uh, since the pandemic is one of the threats for public health and one of uh, the, the priority uh, area uh, that to a certain extent uh, affected the, the, the uh, budget allocation uh, for the other activities within the health sector and sometimes uh, from 
uh, other sectors of the economy. Eventually, uh, there are uh, federal institutions that are located in different parts of the country, uh, which are by their uh, nature federal institutions, uh, for instance, universities, uh, defense establishment, and many grand national projects uh, which directly receive funding from the, the, the federal uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Finance. So uh, I, I uh, conclude uh, my, my reflection by saying that although there were uh, uh, coordinations, uh, uh, resource transfer from the federal to, to the regional state, uh, I, I, I don't believe that uh, centralization uh, has, has uh, taken uh, more weight than, than the previous arrangement of uh, decentralized uh, in terms of uh, physical. Uh, and over to you and thank you. Thank you. So uh, when looking at the German case, Mr. Hoffmann, so you already mentioned that Germans usually prefer nationwide solutions over tailor-made regional approaches um, to problems, problem solving. Well, but on the other hand, uh, one could also expect the lender to have gained strength during the pandemic. Um, what is your point of view about this issue of centralization, recentralization and uh, fiscal transfers from um, the federal to the regional level. The opinion of the people in Germany, and there was a survey uh, recently from the Alsberg Institute, and it was regarding the question, how good is federalism? And the statement, surprisingly, was federalism is is working perfectly and these German states are doing an excellent job and we would like to have an increased federalism. But the questions of detail that clearly stated that the people would like to see more engagement of the federal government in education and the education contents, also financing of education, um, should be regulated more by the federal government. And people also said during the crisis, the uh, federal states should do less, but the federal government more. So it's a kind of uh, bifurcated result. And you, one could argue that people in Germany, and maybe it's similar in other federal structures, people most often don't really know who is really responsible for what. And they have a general understanding or gut feeling or an opinion, but that does not necessarily correspond to what they really are going to state about a certain question. So you really have to uh, consider every aspect isolated and uh, separated. And uh, to answer your other question, the the distribution um, of funds has worked, but only because uh, the federal government uh, took care of responsibilities that would otherwise be um, in the realm of the German states, uh, IT equipment, personal protection equipment for the municipalities. That was paid by the federal government and ensured and optimized the um, the functionality. The states, uh, German states have treated uh, the healthcare a little bit uh, stepmotherly and used it as an instrument to save money in their budget. And in times uh, when everything is running normal, then this is fine, but if such a, a situation occurs like the pandemic, then you can be glad if you have a system that actually works and is not making things complicated. So the federal government has used a lot of money to support the German states and rescued them, one could argue. But that doesn't mean that the system wouldn't be working altogether. You just have to see how you continue down the road and in the future. And with this uh, rescue aid and relief, there 
was not only a financial support by in terms of money, but also uh, with other instruments, because uh, by uh, redistributing the sales tax, um, we have a strict regiment and uh, the states got 45% and the municipalities 2%. And those proportions between uh, federal government and the states was reversed. In the meantime, the states have more than 50% and the federal government less than 15%. And those margins won't be changeable again anymore because you need the approval of the respective states. And uh, the federal government is quite clear that they will never get uh, that money back from the federal states once it was allocated to them. That means we will have an effect on the federal government saying that oh, they have to provide a more financial aid to the municipalities. And another aspect I would like to mention, because I'm representing the only country by the EU that is a member of the EU, but Germany also has to give funds and aid uh, towards the other EU countries within the framework of the European Union because we have started a European recovery fund, a 750 billion uh, euro fund that is supposed to help the countries uh, that are most affected by the pandemic. And those are uh, primarily the countries in the Mediterranean and that didn't have the financial resources by themselves. And this fund is supposed to aid and support not only to uh, close any budget gaps, but also uh, as a response uh, to the pandemic. And this fund that is interestingly uh, called the Next Generation Fund ha is kind of ironic because also the next generation is going to finance this fund and hopefully the next generation is also profiting from this fund as well as the administration and the people of these countries that it's this fund is supporting and that is a very important topic for the future of the European Union potentially that for the first time within the European Union that we have this opportunity to obtain bonds for this fund. And uh, some people uh, talked about the Hamilton effect within the European Union. And uh, this is derived from the American uh, politician Hamilton uh, that also states uh, can have uh, debt. And uh, of course it had an entirely different context back then, not only uh, the debt, but also the tax laws were unified, and that is not the case here in Germany. It's just uh, one side of the coin, which is the debt. And uh, some people are talking about it's uh, one step towards the fiscal union of the European Union. And there are different assessments regarding this process, but it's also one of the les lessons of the COVID pandemic. And uh, I'm returning it back to you. Um, Inaki Chakraborty, what is your experience um, about the Indian uh, way to cope with centralizing trends, if there are any, and uh, how were fiscal transfers organized during the pandemic? Thank you. I think uh, there are a couple of uh, important issues here, and thank you for this very important question. When it comes to issue of centralization, I think in a federal system, centralization versus decentralization is always about getting the right balance. Uh, it's not every time centralization is bad. It is also not correct to centralize things when we are not able to manage. So, so, so it's about getting 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 the right balance of centralization vis-a-vis uh, -vis decentralization. If we are talking about going forward, the role of the local government 
increasing to deal with the pandemic and post-pandemic recovery, if I may say so. I think there has to be greater fiscal resources in the hands of the local governments, be it the state or the third-tier local government, since India has a three-tier federal structure. So now, when we talk about these sources, these sources are constitutionally defined. So unless you really go for a constitutional amendment, you really you cannot centralize or decentralize. So there is a constitutional framework governing these powers. So these powers just cannot be changed because of an event, however severe that event be. Having said that, I think there are two centralization issues that we have to think about going forward. One is borrowing, because the resources are revenue resources, non-debt resources for both the central government as well as for the state governments are coming down because revenues are drying up because of contraction. Now, if we look at the experience of providing more resources to the local level in the last eight, uh, 15, 16 months was through higher borrowing power by the central government and giving a lot of compensations as promised in the GST council. So, so that is also additional borrowing by the states because there was no revenue, the, 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 the revenue resources were declining. So, so, so going forward, I think it is very important to relook at the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. The way they have been framed, it has a fixed borrowing power for the states. Now, the Finance Commission's uh, Finance Commission, Finance Commission, in its report, has said that states' borrowing should be increased to 4.5 percent of GDP. Already we are talking about a fiscal deficit of center and states together around 13.5 to 14% of GDP. Also, we are talking about a debt ratio of around 90% of GDP. So we, we definitely need to provide more resources to the states, and that can only be done by the central government. So if this is centralization, certainly that will be there because unrestricted subnational borrowing also can lead to macroeconomic instability. So at the same time, there is a need for the more resources to deal with the pandemic. So we are fight, uh, kind of you know by dealing with this um, uh, issue and trying to find the right balance. States have already been allowed to borrow up to 2% of GDP in the last fiscal. This fiscal, they have been allowed to borrow by 0.4.5% of GDP. So that is one way of increasing the autonomous fiscal space of the states where they have autonomy, be it borrowing or revenue. But when it comes to centralization or rather central intervention, I would say that there would also be, you know, central intervention in specific areas through conditional grants. For example, if we are saying that there is a need to provide a grant for health system strengthening, and, and we have seen big uh, central centrally sponsored scheme running in health sector. So, and at this point in time, we don't see allocation for those grants coming down. So, 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 so there, there is centralization. You would see when there is a health sector, which is uh, when health health is a state subject, central intervention there in the form of schemes. So, whether it is centralization or or, or an appropriate balance, because. The, uh, because you need to improve health services in a uh, in a time bound manner given the pandemic will have to be seen it depends on the context but there also has there also have, uh, there, there are discussions going on about restructuring CSS how we can centrally sponsor scheme how we can make it more effective uh, and a few which are nationally important so 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 uh, so, so it would depend on on the kind of federalism we are looking at. So, so when two-thirds of the spending is at the state level, almost two-thirds of the spending is at the state level, and most of it through untied conditional grants, the, 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 the role of centralization there is limited. But, 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 but to say that central government intervention in various central schemes, particularly for the health sector, or to deal with the pandemic will come down, I think that's not going to happen. There definitely we would see more centralization. Thank you. Thank you. I think you raised an important point, whether this is already centralization or whether 
what we see is just a kind of rebalancing um, the competences and the fiscal flows between the central level and the regional level. So there are already some questions from the audience. So we are now moving to the questions and comments sections. And I would again like to open the floor to the audience and we look very much forward to getting your comments and questions. You can use the YouTube chat box and Facebook comments section in order to write down your questions. Um, I've got two very interesting questions addressing um, the issue of education during the pandemic. And the first one goes uh, to um, Mrs. Baird. Um, one person is writing, Canadian intergovernmental mechanisms in the case of Canada are important in many respects and many lessons can be learned from the Canadian experience. What have been the federal responses to pandemic situation in the case of education? And more specifically, what role does the Premier's conference play in harmonizing policy initiatives in the case of education. Um, could you possibly um, explain the role of um, coordinating the responses? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I, I talked a little bit earlier about um, some financial support that the federal government had provided to provinces and territories. So this was in the form of a fund called the Safe Return to Class Fund. Um, this is, was money provided to provinces and territories who obviously have jurisdiction over education. Um, and it was to be able to do things like, um, you know, extra cleaning, infection prevention and control, um, adaptation of the learning environment. So a lot of jurisdictions went to remote learning, for example. Um, in some cases, the provinces and territories use that funding for laptops and other IT equipment to be able to support the students and the teachers in a remote learning environment. Um, there was certainly discussion of um, how to adapt and, um, you know, look at the education system at the first minister's level, at the first minister's meetings. Um, and as well, I would say at the FPT health minister's tables and the deputy minister's tables, it is, you know, quite fully within the jurisdiction of the provinces and territories, however. So, you know, while the federal government did support, provide some financial support, there was great flexibility built into that for jurisdictions to use it. Um, the way that they saw fit within their own jurisdictions. And I mean, we saw the, the differences across the country in terms of, you know, some provinces and territories going to remote learning and closing down the physical schools and others maintaining them and keeping them open, others having hybrid models. There were different schedules on openings and closings. Um, so there certainly was, again, sort of that backstop role by the federal government to support provinces and in, in trying to manage education within um, provinces and territories. But it was really up to the provinces and territories and how to use that funding and to do it the way that made the most sense with the kind of the COVID reality and the severity of the number of cases and the situation within their own school systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, and is there any kind of evaluation of best practices? Because in that case, mm -hmm. um, federalism can work as a kind of, uh, um, well, um, best practice laboratory or are there any experience and is there any kind of evaluation? I'm not aware currently of an evaluation. I, I mean, I think a lot of attention and resources are still being devoted to managing the pandemic. A lot of schools in the province that I live in, for example, schools are still, the students are still primarily working remotely uh, or, or learning remotely. Um, but I expect that there'll be a lot of that sort of evaluation and lessons learned exercises that will come in the coming months. Yeah, thank you. And a similar question goes uh, to the German case, to Mr. Hoffmann. Um, there is a person asking, have there been any disagreements between the federal government and the lender, especially related to continuing education and how has it been resolved? Is there any provision for a conference of education minister in Germany? Uh, yes, of course, there are some differences in opinion or difference, different proposed solutions that are substantiated in different ways. 
uh, the situation that was described before has happened in Germany too. There was money given to the lender in order to shore up their IT infrastructure with laptops, with uh, the connections, broadband connections, providing the requisite technical capacity. The federal government financed the lender. However, there is a co-financing system. It was structured in that way. That means the money wasn't really used or didn't really flow if some com if, if some states were not in a position to or did not want to come up with their share of co-financing. So this is a form of compensation through the federal government. It started a while ago, a while before the pandemic. And now there's a new requirement, a new requirement regarding federalism at the at, in the area of education. However, the states can set their educational infrastructure and their curricula themselves. But uh, there's no doubt that in universities and schools and in colleges, a number of obstacles remain to be addressed. And of course, every education minister at the level of the states is asking for the federal education minister very loudly to intervene. And sometimes people only want to get a blank check. They just want uh, the money. And uh, then they want to use the money in a targeted fashion, but they want to be able to have the decision-making capacity themselves. This is a typical controversy that you know from your own countries too. The states want to have the broadest possible latitude of to use the funds, but they want the federal federal government to provide them with material and financial assistance. Thank you very much. The transfers uh, without any kind of centralization. This is uh, the idea behind this. And there is also another question, which is going to um, Pinaki um, Chatrapati. Um, what is your view on the alignment between the assignment of responsibilities and financial capacity of the local governments in India? In India, the functional responsibilities are governed by three lists. One is union list, other is state list, and there is a concurrent list where both center and state governments jointly work. But there is no, 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 no restriction on center intervening in state subjects. Now, if we look at the revenue resources, almost 38% of the total revenue is collected by the states and rest is collected by the center. But when we look at post-transfer revenue and expenditure, it just reverses. So almost 65% of the central taxes and other revenues as a divisible pool of taxes we call uh, goes to the state. So that way it's a fairly decentralized system where more than two thirds of the divisible pool goes to the states. And then there are interventions in the form of various central sector schemes. So that basic fundamental structure probably will not change because that requires, you know, constitutional amendment. So, so that basic fundamental structure is very strong and it will not get disturbed by, uh, you know, by, by, by events. Uh, but 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 if we talk about you know there are specific interventions say social protection measures now the link resources that you need because of the social protection measures that will be a combination in my view I don't know a central support and state putting its matching contribution so that is something which India has done in the past for various sectors uh, to make, make specific interventions. And those kind of specific sector sectoral intervention may go up going forward. But that would be only the 
rest of the expenditure, which 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 is which is not part of that two third of the divisible pool. So so in terms of fundamental principles of fiscal autonomy at the state level, that part I think will have to be ensured because revenues are falling, and then if there is specific intervention required, will have to be done through specific central interventions. <laughs> When we compare the Indian experience to uh, the Ethiopian experience, are there similar um, patterns um, when it uh, when you look at the local level and the fiscal capacity of the local governments there? If we got to Lossa. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, uh, yeah, basically, uh, like I said, uh, we have in Ethiopia two levels of uh, government. One is the federal and the other one is the, the regional states. The ten regional states that uh, comprise uh, the federal uh, government. Uh, basically, this uh, physical uh, decentralization uh, and allocation of resources are being done by uh, House of Federation uh, every year. Uh, and the, the, the criteria to allocate uh, resources uh, take into account a number of uh, issues. One is uh, population uh, size. The other one is the, the budget uh, required to actually put in place the necessary infrastructure, uh, service delivery, uh, and so on. Uh, and the, the other one is the uh, capacity to raise uh, uh, budget uh, as well as to, to, to expand uh, resources. Uh, so uh, whenever uh, such kinds of uh, uh, crisis, uh, natural crisis or man-made crisis uh, happen, uh, as one of developing countries, there could be situation when the regional states uh, uh, apply for additional uh, resources from the, the federal uh, government. Uh, and in fact, we have uh, the Disaster Risk uh, Management Commission that work across uh, the regional states uh, when uh, disasters uh, happen. Uh, so in case of uh, COVID-19, like, like I said, uh, Ethiopia as a nation has received some uh, external resources in the form of uh, donations and in the form of aid. Uh, and so the central, the federal government had to uh, play the role of uh, actually transferring some of the resources to uh, the regional states, uh, particularly through the Ministry of uh, Health. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, there were attempts to uh, basically uh, uh, mobilize uh, some uh, resource uh, at uh, national uh, level. Actually, the uh, ministerial level, one of uh, the subcommittee at the ministerial level was to draw uh, resources from uh, the uh, <coughs> private uh, companies, uh, from, from people and, and so on. And uh, millions of resources uh, were actually generated in relation to uh, COVID-19. So uh, uh, this was uh, carefully put into the government uh, treasury through which it was allocated to the regional states to contain and to uh, manage uh, COVID-19. Uh, this, this was how uh, the resource was uh, actually uh, centrally transferred to the regional uh, states uh, to contain, to actually manage uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, over to you, Professor Sabin. Thank you so much. So there is also another question, which is more general and which is addressed to um, all speakers on the panel. It is more about the political differences and priorities. So the question is how differing political priorities led to differing levels of lockdown, lockdowns and of other restrictions. So this also aims at party political differences, I think, or on different priorities of uh, regional governments and also the federal government. So are there 
patterns, political patterns, um, which you can observe in your country, possibly also in Canada, Mrs. Barrett? Yeah, I think it's true that we saw some differences in approach depending on what part of the country you were looking at and depend on depending on um, the political party. And again, I'm looking at sort of the provincial and the territorial level, maybe also a little bit sort of ideology in different parts of the country. I'd say there's probably a, a stronger feeling of... Um, rights of the individual maybe in Western Canada than there is in other parts of the country. Um, and probably we saw a little bit more resistance to some of the public health measures that were put into place in some parts of the country than other parts of the country. In terms of how um, governments, um, you know, their different approaches, um, another example might be the approach to the international border. So although that's clearly a federal responsibility on, you know, we closed our, our borders, obviously, to, um, to travelers, you know, with some exceptions, obviously, for essential workers or for some other specific classes of travelers for particular reasons. But we saw certainly at some of the discussions at the first minister's level that there were, you know, some jurisdictions and some premiers you know, arguing for a, um, a quicker reopening of the borders for economic reasons, whereas in other parts of the country, you know, in part as well on how hard hit they were by the pandemic, you know, looking for a more conservative approach, um, most more driven by the pub, by the public health, by public health reasons and by economic reasons. So those kinds of differences, that I think, in part were aligned with um, partisan views did by political parties in different regions of the countries, we did sort of see those difference of opinions emerge through a lot of the discussions at um, various intergovernmental tables. Thank you. And what is your experience in, in Germany, Mr. Hoffmann? Uh, can you also observe uh, regional or more party political differences between the different approaches? Your micro, please. The differences between the German states, depending on what party is the ruling party, but um, in fact, the differences were not that big. Of course, there are social democratic uh, approaches and uh, Christian democratic uh, approaches, liberal approaches, how to uh, manage a pandemic uh, like that. And you see differences in their approaches that uh, one party wants to have more a governmental approach and another one wants to have a more fiscal approach, but also with the allocation of the funds, where do the funds come from? And uh, are we supporting the economy or are we supporting the citizens? But surprisingly, uh, those uh, differences were not as significant there were more personal differences in the decision makers in the various uh, German states. Those decision makers uh, simply made mistakes, uh, had the wrong decisions made. And especially in situations where there was an upcoming wave in uh, Corona and COVID numbers, that they made mistakes in how to handle that. And uh, some politicians also um, made a public apology after the fact. And it's just natural that people make mistakes. As long as there's not a structural uh, problem, then it shouldn't be as dramatic. But there were no uh, structural historical uh, diversities that came up. It was more uh, individual mistakes that happened. Thank you. Case, um, that it is a question of political, the quality of political elites and um, the question how they or whether um, the exponential uh, increase of the curve was underestimated by some decision makers. Well, India uh, had a national lockdown during the first wave. 
um, and it slowly opened up when cases started coming down. And when it uh, the second wave came in, that is during April, I think we uh, the kind of lockdown we had was very different. There were lockdowns, and these are micro lockdowns, and they're still going on in many parts of the country, including the city where I live in. So, 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 but, but there was no national lockdown. I think the, the, there is this issue of public health, which is at most important uh, 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 for any government uh, when when there is a pandemic. But, 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 but when we talk about you know life versus livelihood issue, if we look at India's. Uh, states and it and their contribution to India's GDP. Uh, seven states contribute almost fifty percent of India's GDP, and and these are the. And these are big cities, uh, and there are big cities located in these states. So, 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 so when we talk about you know national lockdown, there was this debate whether it should have been done or whether it should not have been done. But the fact here is, in the second wave, when there are micro lockdown, uh, these cities were closed and they are still closed. Uh, so, 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 so this debate continues. Uh, this debate continues. But if we look at um, the going forward, if we really have to uh, prevent the third wave, I think what is most important is rapid vaccination of people. Given that our GDP is, has uh, fallen uh, drastically. And in the first quarter, the GDP growth rate was uh, GDP. There was contractions uh, 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 in the GDP GDP growth. So, 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 a national lockdown going forward may not be the solution. So, these debates, I think, at times, the, um, does not take into consideration that 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 that, that, that there is a huge cost of lockdown. But what is most important also to ensure that that we vaccinate and if I vaccinate fast and, and ensure that the spread of virus is, 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 is controlled. Yeah, thank you. So um, there is also, I think pandemics or a pandemic is also a disruptive event. So what do you think, to what extent did um, the pandemic push modernization such as digitalization in various sectors. So can it also be understand, uh, understood as a kind of chance to modernize various sectors of our society? And if so, are there already some signs uh, um, which you can observe in your country? Um, so is it also a chance? This is the basic idea which is coming up when uh, we look at the end, hopefully at the end of the pandemic. Um, Mr. Hoffman. Micro, you, could you switch on? Funktioniert es jetzt? Is it working now? Good. I didn't mute myself. It's a uh, self-triggering mechanism. Yes, uh, there was a push for modernization. There will be. I really hope that that's the case because, of course, digitalization is a word that's avoidable. It's unavoidable, rather. Uh, but it requires collaboration at various levels of the federal system. And we need to be better, faster, more flexible. We need to be able to cooperate with citizens as well. There's a coronavirus warning app. It's a very good example of this modernization, of, moder of digitalization. There's some states in the world that have totally different tracing and tracking functions in their COVID apps. In Germany, it's a very defensive system. It is very much in line with privacy regulations. Our privacy regulations are very highly valued in Germany 
And some people even exaggerated it to the point that data protection was prioritized even more than the protection of health during the pandemic. These are some areas where we'll need to discuss. Secondly, we have the topic of vaccine production. Here, I'd be happy to address a question to my fellow panelists. What do you think? What will it be like in your federal states? Will patent rights, if not completely opened up, will some of the restrictions be lifted or will they be subject to certain conditions? In Germany, patent law is very, very much friendly to copyright holders. That is something that is in our fundamental system. Intellectual property is very strongly protected. However, you don't have to completely give the priority to that. There's some controlled approvals, uh, some usage could possibly take place, allowing for the multiplication of production and stepping up of production. That would be a big help for our own population, but also it would be a step in solidarity uh, with, with others to produce more vaccines. I'd be very interested in that. Thank you. Um, Pinaki Chakrabarti, uh, in your country, in India, this is possibly also a problem. Could you tell us how this is uh, evaluated and how you cope with this uh, problem of vaccine production and also of modernization in terms of digitalization at the end of the possibly the pandemic? You also, uh, the micro, could you, yeah. Yes, of course, uh, there are um, uh, digital modes of economic engagement becoming, you know, uh, a very common way of, you know, you know, you know, you know, dealing with, you know, uh, um, an alternative to mobility, uh, and that. Uh, certainly, certainly has economic benefits, probably in terms of cost, probably in terms of efficiency. But if we look at uh, sectors uh, of the economy where digitization is possible, there it is happening. But when we talk about digitization globally, particularly in emerging market economies, where you uh, in most cases there are uh, there are economies which are labor surplus economies uh, and uh, 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 and you have large skill unskilled you know uh, or semi skilled workforce i think i think it's very important to understand the the inequality that it can bring in into the system so we have to be uh, you know uh, careful uh, about, uh, you know, uh, replacing, uh, not replacing, uh, we, are, we have to be careful and achieve a right balance when we talk about, you know, pandemic digit, uh, has helped in terms of having digitization and, and going forward, it is going to, certainly it is going to help, but, but, but there is an impact that it can bring it that the digitization itself can bring it in terms of inequality. For example, access to education for poor children. If we don't have a uh, digital uh, way of accessing class, uh, access teaching, uh, a digital way of accessing teaching, uh, so, so that's that's a big problem. Uh, second issue that I would also like to highlight when you talk about digitization, uh, and and we are talking about you know. Uh, service sectors. I think some places you cannot have digitization. If you want to have tourism, you really cannot digitally go. So, 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 so these are the sectors which are seriously affected and there are backward and forward linkages. I think, I, I think it's very important to, to recognize there are certain sectors where digitization is not an alternative. So, 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 so I think, I think it is time also for uh, us who do research, uh, work on policy to look at for how last uh, one year has 
impacted various sectors and these alternative mode of doing work through digitization. I think it's important to understand from a general equilibrium framework how we have been managing our economy and how it is impacting various sectors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, in Canada, is there also um, the, the question or the discussion about how to balance the issues of digitalization and data security? So this is a big issue in, in Germany. Um, are there similar discussions going on in Canada? Yeah, there are definitely. Um, I mean, the, the healthcare data is sort of owned by the provinces and territories, but for certain things, obviously there needs to be sort of data sharing agreements between the different orders of government. Um, you know, one of the things that, that our country is talking about and obviously many countries around the world is some kind of a, a vaccine certificate or accreditation. And so, you know, that would probably be at the federal level in terms of it being internationally recognized for, for Canadian travelers who have been fully vaccinated. But of course, the health data and the information about vaccination will be at the provincial level. So, you know, lots of discussion about how that would work. Um, it, you know, in terms of your broader question about the pandemic being a driver of change, I think absolutely there have, we've already seen things in terms of, you know, especially in Canada with such, you know, a, a huge land mass and lots of parts of the country that are, are rural and remote, you know, the need for more virtual care versus traditional sort of, you know, in-person doctor's care. And then, um, you know, important to be able to have broadband across the country with everybody working from home and with students learning remotely. There was sort of a big uh, amount of pressure on our infrastructure around broadband. And so looking at that going forward and investments that will be need to be made there. And in terms of, you know, uh, vaccines production, I mean, it became quite apparent that, you know, we didn't have a robust domestic biomanufacturing sector. We had to purchase all of our vaccines from international suppliers. So some looking at that as well in terms of building that capacity uh, within Canada. So I think there are quite a few things that came to light and will drive some change and some innovation going forward. Yeah, thank you. And in Ethiopia, is it a similar discussion already going on about how to modernize um, some sectors like health or education at the end of the pandemic? So is it also a driver of uh, modernization in your country? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, my, my connection uh, uh, was lost uh, in the middle. Uh, if you allow me, I can comment on uh, the two things you asked earlier on. Uh, one, on the, the political priority uh, related to the lockdown. Uh, basically, uh, COVID-19 uh, break uh, 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 Eruption was uh, when we look for uh, Ethiopian election in May 2020, uh, as a result of which uh, the government had to actually postpone the election by about one year. Uh, and this uh, was not equally uh, bought by all political parties uh, uh, in the country. So uh, the ruling party uh, has gone through the formal uh, way of postponing the, the uh, election. Uh, this is one point. Uh, regarding the lockdown, uh, basically, given our uh, economic situation where, uh, especially in urban areas, uh, uh, more than half of the population live on uh, uh, informal sector, uh, hand to mouth livelihood uh, situations, uh, rushing for uh, lockdown uh, was not a feasible uh, situation, as a result of which uh, partial, partial sort of lockdown was uh, made in terms of actually uh, school closure, uh, work at home for uh, civil servants, uh, and uh, closure of universities uh, and the like. Otherwise, uh, uh, our government didn't go for uh, total uh, lockdown. Uh, as far as the, the education is concerned, yes, COVID-19 has given a uh, good opportunity, especially uh, when uh, thinking about how to uh, continue the interrupted classes uh, on the basis of uh, uh, modern technology. Uh, in many urban areas, 
attempt was made at uh, public as well as the private school to rely on uh, different social medias to actually continue uh, classes, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, a new innovation in, in, uh, in a way. Uh, and secondly, uh, in the area of health uh, sector, uh, COVID-19 has, has created uh, a good opportunity for, for the government uh, to think about uh, what if similar kinds of crisis would happen uh, uh, in the future, uh, which means uh, the, the capacity building, the, the preparedness uh, uh, situations were uh, put in the uh, health sector uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, we, to a certain extent, can consider COVID-19 uh, as uh, opportunities uh, in certain uh, sector uh, of uh, the economy. Uh, like I said, uh, many schools have uh, started thinking about online learning, uh, e-learning, uh, if uh, the actual class learning cannot uh, uh, take place. Uh, with this, over to you, uh, Professor. Yeah, thank you. So I see that there are no further questions and uh, um, I don't like to wrap up this discussion because the four models of federalism are really different. But I think there are some similarities or commonalities which I would like to stress at the end of our discussion. So the first one is um, that the pandemic has not changed the basic construction of federalism in your country so far. But there will probably be some institutional adjustments in the future, um, smaller ones, reforms, or whatever. And the second finding is that um, we cannot observe centralizing trends, so a real centralization, but the pandemic has intensified coordination between the different federal units and entities in the countries. And finally, federalism is not a perfect institutional structure, but it allows for coordinating um, responses and for allowing regional tailor-made responses to um, problems like a pandemic and to contain the virus at the level of um, the cities and also of the districts and the regions. So, let me uh, end on an optimistic note. This is that there will be probably some improvements. So hopefully there will be some modernization uh, because the pandemic has uncovered deficiencies and, and problems in all countries. And so this could be the chance to uh, be more efficient in the future and at the same time um, to keep an eye on, on the democracy democratic structures. This is also necessary and to preserve uh, democracy in our countries. So thank you so much for your contributions and your input, which um, allowed us to share our th your thoughts with um, the audience here in, in the room. And um, well, thank you so much. And um, also thanks to the audience for attention, for comments and questions. And now the Forum of Federation invites all viewers to complete the post-event survey, which will provide an important feedback to the Forum of Federation. And so we really appreciate, appreciate your participation. And you can just click on the link in the YouTube chat box and the Facebook comments section. Um, the link is posted by the Forum staff. And for me, it's time to say goodbye. But before, I will now hand back to Forum President Rubak Chikapadai for his concluding remarks. Rubak Thank you very much. Question. Thank you, Sabine, for conducting such a wonderful panel. And my thanks to the panelists for being so engaged, and in particular, addressing some very tricky questions that came from the audience. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to say we had almost 90 people watch this online, live. And I'm sure uh, as the days tick along, uh, we will have at least a couple of hundred more people who will watch uh, the recording of this event. Uh, I know this is um, uh, a very busy time, uh, both for you, Louise, as well as uh, Dr. Hoffman. I know you're, you're in the middle of, uh, of uh, 
of managing intergovernmental relations in your own country. So thank you very much for taking the time uh, away from, from your official duties to be with, uh, be with us today. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Pinaki, uh, always a pleasure to see you. And uh, I, I know it's very late for you in Delhi. So again, thanks very much for taking the time to join us uh, here this, this morning or this evening, uh, your time. Uh, Ato Degefe, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for your, your joining us as well. I know it was the last minute uh, that you were asked. I know Speaker Adam Farah was meant to be here. So thank you again for clearing your schedule. Uh, I, I, think, I think the audience really appreciated the various perspectives, the comparative perspectives that were brought to bear. And I, I agree largely with Sabine's uh, conclusions that the basic fabric of federalism is, is unlikely to remain changed in most of these cases with adjustments along the way. What, what really uh, I found very, um, uh, in each of these cases, what, what I find particularly striking is the intensity of intergovernmental uh, uh, cooperation or, or well, interaction, not always cooperation, but interaction. Uh, I mean, Louise talked about the, the first minister's meetings, uh, similar meetings in Germany, uh, in India. Uh, I, I know that uh, through the, the Interstate Council, which in 30 years met probably 10 times now every week or every, or every other week, uh, the prime minister is talking to his counterparts. Uh, similarly, Ethiopia. So this is very instructive. Thank you again. And uh, I think we'll conclude the, the event here. Uh, I look forward to being in touch with all of you in due course. Thank you again.